ground types just like me have been shaking up the competition since 1998. But are they going to cut it to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke where any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever? I'm not allowed to use any items from the bag in battle and set mode is mandatory. For extra challenge, I'm not allowed to Dynamax my Pokemon or level past the next gym leader. And the first destination on our journey is the wild area. Since the early game of Sword and Shield is stacked against us, we're going to need a pretty good Pokemon, which is why I set my sights on the overworld Diggersby that you can find in the rolling fields, which can actually be as low as level 15. A pretty awesome pickup since Bunnelby isn't even a ground type and normally evolves at level 20. That plus speed nature is always welcome, and even though Cheek Pouch isn't quite its hidden ability huge power, it's a pretty good ability for this early in the game. For some more ground type goodness, I head over to the Isle of Armor. Uh, okay. And here I pick up one of the original ground types, Sand Shrew. And Iceland here got an attack boosting nature, which really isn't too shabby. Before moving on to Motostoke, I head to South Lake Milok, where we can pick ourselves up a Ninkata. We're sadly not going to be able to evolve it, but that bug type could come in handy versus Milo. Moving on to Route 3, I have the opportunity to catch a Mudbray, but unfortunately I get the own tempo ability instead of the awesome stamina. From there we move on to Galar Mine 1, where I pick up a Diglett. And look, it's not often I'm scared this early in a run, but this toddler in a grown man's body has me fearing for my life. You see, Milo is a Grass-type enthusiast, which is pretty bad for me as a Ground-type enjoyer. However, with that said, even though Iceland has a minus speed nature, we can still outspeed this Gossifler and take it out with one hit using Leech Life. Now, the real threat is Eldegoss, which kind of looks like Megamind had a kid with pollen allergy. Max overgrowth from this thing is actually a huge threat, so I immediately go for Protect with Sandshrew, hoping I can take one to waste one turn of Dynamax. This unfortunately means that Iceland is going to be taken out the very next turn. Not a great sign that we have a death this early in the run, but at least that's two out of three Dynamax turns over with. And to waste the final one, I send in the Netherlands to go for Protect as Eldegoss goes for a Max Strike, which lowers our speed, but we were already slower anyway. This means that Eldegoss's Dynamax turns are finally up, and for whatever reason, it goes for Leafage instead of Magical Leaf here, giving me an opportunity to go for Leech Life, getting most of my HP back. And I'm not sure why Milo didn't go for Magical Leaf ever here, because he could have definitely taken out Ninkata, but the Netherlands live on. Being prepared to lose two Pokemon in this fight, all things considered, I think it went pretty well. I know old folks like us can get carried away offering advice, but the most important thing for young ones like you is to live the way you want. Yeah, well I would if all my personal information wasn't abused on the internet all the time. Well, that would be a problem if I didn't have this video sponsor, Incogni, a fantastic way to protect your personal data while using the internet. Because data brokers are collecting and selling your personal info without your knowledge to businesses that can do whatever they want with it. Like me, you might be used to getting telemarketing calls and spam emails all the time, or you might be getting more targeted ads to try and manipulate you into spending unnecessary money. And while you do have the right to request the data brokers delete this information about you, it would take forever to do manually if you could even find the slimy brokers in the first place. And Incogni won't just find them for you, but automatically request your data's removed and secure. These brokers could be selling your name, email, phone number, and much more. So just give Incogni the wheel and watch them update you as they remove whatever you tell them to clear. So if you'd like to feel safer and less bothered on the internet and help out me in this channel, go ahead and visit incogni.com forward slash antler where the first 100 people to sign up get 20% off. So stay safe out there and let's get back to gaming. Immediately after beating the gym, the Netherlands wants to evolve, which sadly we can't allow. NASA being our next opponent could be a huge problem, so I head over to Lake Axwell to pick myself up a whooper. And by the grace of Arceus, Finland here has Water Absorb. And not only that, at level 20, we can already evolve it into a Quagsire. I also make a quick detour to Pot Bottom Desert to pick up a Sand Dial, and it, honestly, either Moxie or Intimidate are goaded abilities, so I'm happy either way. And with a full team of six, it's now time to take on Nessa and her water types, which would be a massive problem if we didn't have Quagsire with Water Absorb. This allows us to easily take out Goldeen with a couple of Earthquakes, and even though I get flinched a couple of times by Aracuda, our leftovers keep us healthy, and it goes down swiftly as well. This only leaves Dynamax Dreadnought, which honestly could still be a problem. It hits me with a Max Darkness, which does about 30% and lowers my special defense as I go for a Yawn. I then go for Protect, meaning that the second Max Darkness barely does anything. And after getting some leftovers recovery, the Dreadnought falls asleep because of Yawn. This completely skips its final turn of Dynamax, allowing me to do about 40% with an Earthquake as it then returns to its regular size. Staying asleep the next turn, and now that it doesn't have the extra health from Dynamax, I can easily take out its remaining health with another Earthquake, claiming the second Gym Badge.
Look, if we're at a seafood restaurant, what exactly are we eating, Rose? Making my way back to Motostoke through Galar Mine number two, I make sure to pick up a Shellos. It's not quite a ground type yet, but it will be, and I kind of ran out of countries including land. We can then evolve Switzerland into Doug Trio before it's time to take on Kabu and his fire types. And the plan here was to do some quick EV training for Diggersby to outspeed Ninetales, which I immediately realized that I forgot to do. Unfortunately, this means that I waste my Rossberry immediately and then go for a Sword Stance, which means that the Ninetales can just go for a Will-O-Wisp the next turn as it pleases but for some reason it just goes for Ember, allowing me the chance to take it out with an Earthquake. Even still, this doesn't bode particularly well for us, since he now can just send in Arcanine, which is going to lower our attack by one stage with Intimidate, and then just outspeed us going for a Will-O-Wisp of its own, and this burn we can't get rid of. But even after the burn and Intimidate, my Earthquake is doing more than half to the Arcanine, meaning that after I tank a Flame Wheel the next turn, we can actually take it out as well. But Ninetales and Arcanine really aren't the problem. We're going to face our first Gigantamax Pokemon, Pokemon sent to Scorch. And I really didn't want to risk this thing going for a G-Max sent to Ferno, locking in the Pokemon that I switch in, so I decided to just stay in with Ireland and unfortunately go down to a Flutterby. With two more Gigantamax turns left, I unfortunately have to make another sacrifice, sending in the Netherlands and going for Protect as it hits me with the sent to Ferno, effectively sealing the Netherlands' fate since I no longer can switch out. However, because of Protect, I wasn't taking out the last turn, meaning that Kabu has to waste his final Gigantamax turn taking out Ninkata. This gives me a free switch into Quagsire as Scorch is taken out of its Gigantamax form. And since we have a plus defense nature on Quagsire and its defense is pretty good to begin with, a Bug Bite does about 20% as I hit it for way over half with a Waterfall. I then recover a bit of health with Leftovers as Kabu decides to get sneaky going for a smoke screen, but to no avail since I connect with the next Waterfall, meaning that we claim the third Gym Badge. Honestly, that would have gone so much better if I would have just done my preparations, but I'll take it. Hello again, Wild Area, my old friend. I've come back to you even stronger than before. That makes one of us hop since my team is weaker than ever. And for that reason, it's time to get some upgrades. First of all, a trap inch at Hammerlock Hills. I name it Greenland since it's close enough to a country. I then head to the Stony Wilderness to catch a Drillbur, which I named Poland. I can't believe I forgot Poland. I love the Witcher. I'm sorry, Poland. And we can even immediately evolve it into the awesome Excadrill, which is known as the Drill King. I don't even need to write a joke about that. We can also evolve New Zealand into Crocorock, Greenland into Vibrava, and Thailand into Mudsdale. Before heading to Route 6, where I was expecting to pick up a Silly Cobra, but I actually found a Hippopotas. For now, he's going in the box, but I'm sure Disneyland could come in very handy at some point with that Sandstream ability. And thus the time has come to face the fourth gym leader, the Invoker himself, Alistair and his Ghost Types. Leading off with Yawmask, I decide to immediately take it out with a Crunch from New Zealand, but its Wandering Spirit ability swaps places with Intimidate, lowering Crocorock's attack. Kind of an unfortunate thing for it to do while it's taken out, since we now have to face Mimikyu with minus one attack. On top of that, Mimikyu even gets a critical hit with a Slash, leaving us at just 32 HP as a Crunch breaks its disguise and unfortunately does not get the defense drop. Regardless, I decided to just swap out into Mudstale as the Mimikyu goes for another Slash, which does basically nothing. To boost its damage, it goes for Hone Claws, increasing its attack and accuracy, but unfortunately it's not going to get the chance to use them since a single Heavy Slam is enough to take it out. With Mimikyu out of the way, Cursula is next, and unfortunately I don't have a super effective move for this thing, but even still, a high horse power leaves Cursula in the red, unfortunately activating its weak armor, lowering defense but increasing its speed. So after getting hit by a Hex and recovering a little bit of health with my Citrus Berry, it's gonna be enough to survive the next Hex since the Cursula is now faster because of weak armor, but another high horsepower is enough to take it out, leaving only Gigantamax Gengar. And this thing is a massive problem since it's incredibly fast and has the means to boost its special attack. So to start with, I do what I've been doing thus far, going for Protect, which allows Thailand to survive on 25 HP after the first Dynamax move. Since Mudsdale is already unfortunately on the chopping block here, I decide to go for the double protect and I end up actually getting it to my surprise and surviving the following Max Darkness. It's unfortunately not enough to survive the third, but in Mudsdale's sacrifice, we do at least get rid of all of Gengar's Dynamax turns. We can then send in Switzerland as Gengar turns back to normal, and since Doug Trio is faster than Gengar, we can go for an Earthquake, and because it doesn't have Dynamax health, it's a one-shot. With Alistair out of the way, we have to face a 
Opal, but Opal is honestly such a joke. The fact that we have a Steel type in Excadrill, we can just set up with Sword Stance and then take out her entire team. The fact that she straight up gives you free boosts every few turns makes it incredibly easy to take her out as long as you don't have a team fully weak to fairies. As for someone who I definitely underestimated, we have to go up against Hop. And I had a perfectly good plan going into this fight. Take out the Trevenant with an Iron Head, then the Heat more with an Earthquake, and the Boltund with an Earthquake as well. It's once we get to Rillaboom that I started having some problems. Figuring I could most likely survive one drum beating, I go for an Iron Head, manage to get the flinch, and go for the second one, leaving Rillaboom in the red. Unfortunately, I don't get the double flinch here, meaning that I do get hit by the drum beating, but I do manage to survive just the way I figured I would, but I forgot completely about the fact that drum beating lowers your speed. Since I'm no longer faster than the Rillaboom, I have to swap into something, and nothing else on my team is going to handle that drum beating, so unfortunately, I have to let Switzerland go before switching back into Excadrill and taking out the Rillaboom with another Iron Head. Not the ideal way to lose a Pokemon, but alas. After that disaster, at least we can finally evolve Krokrok into Crocodile. I also head over to the Watchtower Ruins to pick up a Golit, which ends up having its better Iron Fist ability. Then before challenging the next gym, I make sure to evolve Disneyland into Hippowdon and Legoland into Gastrodon. And with those preparations out of the way, we're as ready as we're gonna get to face the Ice-type gym leader, Melanie. And she's the entire reason I decided to play Shield over Sword for that extra bit of challenge. I start by using a quad effect of Rock Slide to take out her Frost Moth, as she then sends in Darmanitan, which is why I equipped Excadrill with a Choice Scarf to outspeed, but it just barely ends up hanging on, but it very fortunately just goes for Taunt before transforming into its Zen mode. Because of that Choice Scarf, we are, however, still able to outspeed, taking out the Darmanitan with a now quad effect of Rock Slide, as she then sends in Ice Q. And here's where I make what I was gonna say is one of the biggest mistakes of the run, but I've made some pretty big mistakes so far. I switch in Gastro, figuring it can't hurt me too much with ice moves, and then I can hit it on the special side to avoid ice face, but I completely forget about freeze dry, which fortunately does not take me out, leaving me at 7 HP. A citrus berry then recovers a little bit of my health before I can hit it for some pitiful damage with scald, not even getting the burn before I then have to swap out back into Poland. On the switch, I get hit by a freeze dry, and the next turn I go for an iron head, getting rid of the ice face, as the ice Q then goes for an icy win to lower my speed, mitigating the effect of my choice scarf. Because of that speed drop and the lack of ice face, the ice Q now outspeeds me, going for hail, which of course regenerates the ice face, meaning that when I go for an iron head following that up, it's just gonna destroy the ice face. How sick are you of ice face? Another freeze dry takes me deep into the yellow down to 43 HP, as I can finally go for an iron head against a non-ice face ice Q taking it out. This just leaves her Gigantamax Pokemon Lapras, and expecting it to go for a water move, I decide to swap out into Finland, so that when it Gigantamaxes and goes for the max geyser, we can fully dodge it with water absorb. I then once again go for protect to reduce the damage from her second dynamax move, G Max Resonance, which not only does damage but also sets up Aurora Veil. For her third and final dynamax turn, G Max Resonance does quite a bit of damage as I hit her with a yawn. I then go for protect to make sure that the Lapras falls asleep. I don't really have any good choices here, and I kind of have to risk it going into New Zealand using Brick Break to break its Aurora Veil. And since the Lapras stays asleep for three turns, we don't end up having to sacrifice. Crocodile earning the sixth gym badge. But this marks a pivotal point in the run since we now have to go up against Hop in a fight that I really didn't expect to go the way it did. For whatever reason, I expected Hop to send in his team in the listed order, but of course he sends in Rillaboom right after Dubwool. Sort of panicking, I immediately pivot out into Disneyland to set up the Sandstorm, and of course I get hit by a drum beating on the switch, lowering my speed, but also doing just over half health so that my Citrus Berry activates. And that Citrus Berry is going to give me just enough help to survive the next drum beating in the red, which in turn is going to allow me to retaliate with an Ice Fang, but it didn't quite do as much damage as I was hoping for. Since Disneyland is a goner if I stay in, I decide to swap out into Poland, hoping that it can take a drum beating just above half, but unfortunately that is not the case, so I immediately have to swap out once again into Legoland. Because Excadrill is a steel type, I do get hit by the Brick Break on the Switch, but unfortunately I'm not going to be faster, which means that Gastro is a goner after that 
that drum beating. Expecting Vibrava to be able to tank one drum beating, I send him in, and it ends up being really close, coming down to just 13 HP. I then hope Crunch can take it out, but it's not even enough after a critical hit, so the following turn I go for Protect, hoping that Hale will take it out. However, both Rillaboom and Greenland have just enough health in the red to survive. At this point, I figure that Vibrava is going to be more useful than Quagsire in the long run, so unfortunately, I do end up sacrificing Quagsire here just so that I can get a safe switch. This does mean that the Rillaboom goes down to Hale, but it also means that we're probably going to have a lot more difficult a time versus Nessa in the Pokemon League. Hop's next Pokemon is Corviknight, but since it basically can't hurt Excadrill, it goes down to Hale after a couple turns of Rock Slides. Pinkurchin is then completely destroyed by an Earthquake before he sends in his final Pokemon, Snorlax. Unsure whether or not Poland can get the one-hit KO, I swap out into New Zealand to get the Intimidate as the Snorlax goes for a Crunch, which does basically no damage since it's resisted. I then go for a Brick Break, and it's looking like another one would take it out. However, the Snorlax goes for Body Slam and ends up getting the Paralysis. My team is looking incredibly roughed up at this point, and if I stay in with New Zealand, it is going to go down, so I do have to make a sacrifice here no matter what, figuring that Disneyland is my least useful team member. The one final thing it can do for me, however, is set up the sand as it then goes down to Body Slam. The Sandstorm is at least going to grant Poland a power boost through its Sand Force ability, allowing me to take out the Snorlax with an Earthquake, although I doubt I needed that extra power, especially with that critical hit. We just lost half the team to hop. And for that reason, we're in desperate need of some upgrades, so I headed back to Motostoke to pick up a Barboach. I name it Portland since we're very out of countries and immediately evolve it into a Whizcash. It claims a large swamp to itself. If a foe comes near it, it sets off tremors by thrashing around. Uh, are you the legendary Shrek? I can then head on over to the Dusty Bowl to pick myself up a pile of swine, which I named Judy Garland. Had to go over the rainbow to find that one. And once we relearn Ancient Power, we can immediately evolve her into Mamoswine. With the current level cap of 46, we're also able to evolve Golet into Golurk and Vibrava into Flygon. And I'm gonna be honest, Piers was a complete pushover. He doesn't Dynamax, and we don't have Pokemon weak to his. So the seventh gym badge is pretty much free, but I can't really say the same for the eighth. Raihan's double battle gym fight is a formidable obstacle that you need to plan for meticulously. The very first turn, I make sure to strike Flygon with an expert belt boosted Ice Shard to take it out in one shot to not have to deal with any breaking swipes, after which I then go for a Dragon Dance with Flygon. Finally, the Gigalith sets up Stealth Rocks before Raihan sends in his next Pokemon, Sandaconda. The following turn, I once again use Dragon Dance with Greenland to boost my attack and speed, after which Mamoswine goes for an Ice Fang on the Sandaconda, but because it has pretty awesome defense, it's not enough to take it out. I then get hit by a Glare, which I prepared for with a Lumberry on Flygon, but it actually ends up going for Mamoswine as well as Gigalith with a Body Press. This Paralysis might make me lose Mamoswine, but I don't get paralyzed the next turn, allowing me to take out the Sandaconda with an Ice Shard. Flygon once again goes to Dragon Dance to even further boost attack and speed as Gigalith goes for another Body Press, hitting Judy Garland down to 5 HP as Raihan sends in his final Pokemon Duraludon, and since I really don't want to lose Mamoswine, I send in Rhode Island. I do this expecting Duraludon to try and strike down Mamoswine. Unfortunately, a plus 3 superpower isn't quite enough to take the Duraludon out, but it just ends up going for Max Knuckle versus Rhode Island, which of course doesn't affect it. And finally, Flygon gets hit deep into the yellow by a critical hit body press. The next turn, I go for Protect with Golurk to make sure I don't get hit by the incoming Earthquake, which is going to hit both Duraludon, taking out the remainder of its health and the Gigalith for all it has left. And honestly, I was incredibly prepared to lose Mamoswine, particularly after that paralysis, which I definitely wasn't prepared for, but not any deaths versus this Raihan fight is something I'll certainly take. With all the gym badges out of the way, it's time to head on to the capital city of Winden, where our first opponent in the Champions Cup is Marnie. And there's a Marnie fight that you faced before Piers that I didn't even include for the same reason that this fight was completely trivial. As long as you have a dark type or really any physical physical attacker that resists dark at all, this fight is incredibly easy. In my case, all I had to do was set up a few bulk ups and then go to town on our entire team. Not exactly rocket science, but what do you expect from the first fight in the Champions Cup? The second fight, however, is one I've been looking forward to for a long time, and it's the rematch versus Hop to finally decide who the better trainer is, and this time I came with a fully-fledged plan. After punching my way through Dubwool, Snorlax, and Corviknight, 
Op sends in his Pinkurchin, the key to my plan coming to fruition. You see, this Pinkurchin only has two attacking moves, Poison Jab and Thunderbolt, neither of which can do anything to Excadrill. And so, I was able to set up the plus six attack with Sword Stances, and Hop just had to sit there and watch, because there was nothing he could do about it. One earthquake later, and his Pinkurchin was a goner. Think you got me backed into a corner? Oh, yes, I do. Ah, sweet justice. Someone who's definitely a problem, however, is Oleana, so I make my way back to the wild area to pick myself up a Palpitoad. I name it after Sweden's largest island, Gotland, and immediately evolve it into Seismitoad. And the thing is, Oleana can be an absolute terror since her team is so diverse. Most of her team is also fast, very strong Pokemon, so you need a good strategy to deal with them, much like Choice Scarf Crocodile to just take out Frostlass with one crunch. Then comes her Milotic, which makes me miss Water Absorb Quags a lot since its only attacking move is Surf. On the turn I switch to Seismitoad, it goes for Aqua Ring and then outspeeds me going for Safeguard as I hit it with a Power Whip, but unfortunately it does a little bit less damage than I was hoping for it to do. Double unfortunately, since my Lodic outspeeds, it can also just recover back most of its health with Recover, meaning that I'm pretty much back to square one with Power Whip. The worst part about this is that I basically can't switch into anything else, meaning that I'm locked into this dance, and Power Whip has five less PP than Recover, does. Triple, unfortunately, I didn't get a single critical hit during my 10 Power Whip PPs, meaning that it completely stalled me out of it, so I have to start hitting it with Ice Punches and Rock Slides. An incredibly grim and pathetic fate for our newest team member, so I go ahead and swap in Rhode Island. Quadruple, unfortunately, my Lodic still has PP left for recover after stalling us out and almost gets back to full as I hit it with a Thunder Punch. Once again caught in the same kind of dance, my Lodic goes for yet another recover as I hit it with one more Thunder Punch but this time I get it into the red and paralyze it, meaning that I will be faster the next turn, able to take it out with a final Thunder Punch. This baits in Oleana's Serena, and expecting it to go for a Trop Kick, I immediately swap out into Poland. However, for some reason it goes for Acrobatics instead, which barely does any damage to Poland, and although x Scissor doesn't quite take Serena out, even a Trop Kick doesn't do too much damage. The worst part about Trop Kick is that it lowers our attack, but since it's at such low health, an x Scissor is enough to take it out anyway, Way, and it's not like we would stay in against the Salazzle regardless. I don't exactly have anything that likes to get hit by fire type moves, but at least Golurk doesn't take too much from the Incinerate since it's gonna have to take another one right afterwards before it can retaliate with high horsepower, and since it's stab and quad super effective, it obviously takes Salazzle out. This just leaves Gigantamax Garboder, and since I don't really want to swap anything into a Max Quake, I sort of have to leave Golurk in here to take the fall. That's at least before I thought about the fact that I have an Intimidate Crooked dial on my team that would have been fine taking that Max Quake and we would have still had Golurk on the team. Heck, an Earthquake from New Zealand even almost takes out the Garboder in one shot, but unfortunately it activates its weak armor as I then get hit by another Max Quake. And as you can see, the Max Quake barely does anything, but I honestly expected it to do quite a bit more. Oleana uses her final Gigantamax turn to use G-Max Malodor, which is resisted and thus barely does anything at all, but she does manages to pull off the poison before getting taken out by a final Earthquake. I don't know how obvious it is that I haven't been doing a single damage calc for this entire run, but uh, it should be pretty obvious at this point. Since our team is once again in shambles, I go to the wild area to pick up a Steelix. I name her Sarah Highland. Please don't hate me, Sarah. And then it's time to face Bead for the final time. And honestly, even though we don't get the free boost the way we do in Opal's battle, it was pretty much free to win this fight anyway, since I could just get an Intimidate off against Mawile, swap into Excadrill and get my free sword stances, and then just tear through those fairy types. Man, steel types are absolutely busted. This leads us to the way more important battle versus Nessa, and now that we don't have Quagsire anymore, it's definitely not a freebie. My first order of business is to rock slide the Golisopod, getting it below half health, which is gonna swap it out with Emergency Exit, and and she goes into Barascuda. Since this thing has both the speed and power of a fast and powerful truck, I swap in New Zealand to get an Intimidate. I then get hit by a Drill Run on the Switch, which would have been super effective against Excadrill, but wouldn't Liquidation always have been better? Because of the Intimidate, I do manage to tank a Liquidation, but get the Defense Drop, and I can drop an Earthquake on this thing, which unfortunately doesn't quite take it out, so I decide to spare my Intimidator by sending in Steelix, who has some massive defense since it tanks a Liquidation and only takes about 20%. Another Liquidation gets a high roll, taking me down below half, activating my 
my Citrus Berry, getting me back to about 75% again, as I can then hit it with a Thunder Fang to take it out. One threat out of the way, her next Pokemon is sending back in Golisopod. Figuring I can probably take a Liquidation based on Steelix's massive defense, it actually does way more than I expected, and a Thunder Fang doesn't even take Golisopod out, leaving it in the red, so I have to swap Sarah Highland out for Portland. I end up having to tank a Liquidation on the Switch, which I survive above half health, but it does get the defense drop, however, a bit of leftovers recover some of the health. None of this is a massive problem, however, since I can outspeed the next turn going for a Rock Slide, taking out the Golisopod. Nessa then sends in her Seeking, which is a physical attacker, and since Wizcash's defense is lowered, I end up swapping out to Greenland. I figured I was going to be tanking a Waterfall here, but the Seeking just ends up going for an Aqua Ring. The next turn I go for a Dragon Dance, since I'm at full health, as the Seeking hits me with a Waterfall, which does about 33%. I don't really want to be taking any more damage here, so I go for an Earthquake, taking out the Seeking in one hit. This means Nessa will send in her Pelipper, which is a massive problem since it sets up the rain with its Drizzle ability. I then figure a plus one Rock Slide will be enough to take it out, but I end up missing the Rock Slide, which means that a Rain Boosted Stab Water Pulse is unfortunately enough to knock out Greenland, especially since it's a critical hit. Not at all how I wanted things to go for Flygon, which means I have to send in Poland to go for the Rock Slide, which I miss as well, but the Pelipper at least just goes for Tailwind. I can't really switch here, so unfortunately I just have to sit here and take it, and amazingly Poland survives, so I can go for a Rock Slide, which isn't quite enough to take out the Pelipper. Figuring that Excadrill is going to be a lot more useful for the rest of the run than Steelix, I have to sacrifice it here just to get a safe switch into something else, and that something else happens to be Wizcash. You see, if you think we lost the only Dragon Dancer on the team when we lost Flygon, that's certainly not the case. After the Pelipper goes for a Roost, I do some pitiful damage with a Rock Slide, as the rain then clears, I get some Leftovers recovery, and the Tailwind disappears. Nessa's pretty much guaranteed to go for Tailwind here, so I take the turn to set up a Dragon Dance to boost my attack and speed, as it indeed goes for the Tailwind. This does mean she outspeeds the next turn, hitting me with an Air Slash, but I don't flinch, meaning that I get off a second Dragon Dance. After Leftovers Recovery, I figure I can survive another Air Slash, so I go for a third Dragon Dance, but the Pelipper just goes for Roost. Figuring I could have survived an Air Slash last turn, I go for a fourth Dragon Dance to get some more boost, as the Pelipper indeed goes for Air Slash, which leaves me at 40 HP before Leftovers. I then go for a Rock Slide, this time not missing, taking out this pesky Pelipper in one shot. As if that's not enough, plus four attack is enough for a Stab Earthquake to even one-shot Dynamax Dreadnought. Since Nessa downsized our team by 33%, I had to come up with a new plan to try and take on Alistair. And right off the bat, his Dusk Noir is kind of an issue, so I go ahead and start with a Tickle to lower its attack and defense as he goes for Rock Tomb to lower my speed, but it barely does any damage. And in fact, I continue to go for Tickle since I'm trying to get the Dusk Noir to use Disable since what I really want to do is start using Dragon Dances and boosting my attack and speed. However, Alistair didn't seem interested in using Disable whatsoever. Instead, we kind of got caught in the loop of me using Dragon Dance and then him using Rock Tomb to lower my speed back down right afterwards. This was really annoying since I kept getting the attack boost, but without the speed boost, I'm not going to be outspeeding his Gengar, which means I would just end up losing Portland. And so once again, and I don't know how this keeps Keeps happening in this run, I had to keep going for Dragon Dance until he was out of Rock Tombs. And as you can expect, this process took me a really long time. I probably got through a whole season of The Office. But eventually, after eons of waiting, it finally was out of Rock Tombs and started to go for Shadow Punches. This means I can finally get Portland's speed up to plus two, the minimum requirement to tear through all of Alistair's Pokemon. And I gotta say, it was incredibly cathartic to see them all fall one by one after that extreme extremely exhausting process. However, with Alistair beat, we still have one more gym leader to face, Raihan. And in this fight, it's gonna be Mamoswine's time to shine. First off, taking out Torkoal with an Expert Belt Earthquake, then doing the exact same to Turtonator. Gudra gets hit by an Expert Belt Super Effective Ice Fang and holds on on what must be one HP, but it just ends up setting up the Rain Dance. So after Raihan goes for a full restore, a couple of Ice Shards is all I need to take it out. As for Flygon, Stab, Quad Super Effective, Expert Belt Ice Shard is all it takes to take it out, meaning he's only left with Gigantamax Duraludon. But before he's able to Gigantamax, I swap in New Zealand who gets an Intimidate off to lower its attack. 
Since it was attacking Mamoswine, it goes for a max Steel Spike, which does about 40% to Crocodile, and then boosts to Raladon's defense. An Earthquake then does way more than I expected it to, which of course means it's a critical hit, as I then get hit by a max Knuckle, which leaves me at 43 HP and boosts to Raladon's attack. Another Earthquake is then enough to take out Duraladon beating Raihan, and it's safe to say that that critical hit meant that I didn't have to lose Crocodile, but even still, we lost a third of the team during the Champions Cup. Before we can face the champion, we do have to do a bit of Macro Cosmos nonsense facing Rose, but since he has a team full of Steel types, you can imagine how it went. However, since we currently only have four team members, I decide to take a little bit of a detour to the Crown Tundra. However, to be able to even catch any Pokemon in the Crown Tundra, we have to face Rose's brother, Peony. And this guy's got a couple of level 70 Pokemon, but fortunately, much like Rose, he's got Steel types, and thus we can take out his Caparaja with an extra about boosted Earthquake from Excadrill. He then has a sturdy Agron, so knowing I can't take it out in one hit no matter what and it would destroy me with a body press, I swap out into Whizcash, who can at least tank said body press and then break the sturdy with hail. I can then outspeed with a quad effective Earthquake and equipped with a choice band, it's enough to take out said Agron. And now that we've beat Peony, we can head to the tunnel towards the top where we can find ourselves a Gibble. Now I know Holland's just a part of the Netherlands, but I was desperate for names a long time ago. And since Holland was caught at level 60, we can easily just level it up twice, evolving it first to Gabite, then into Garchomp. This means our final team consists of Judy Garland with a pretty straightforward moveset of Earthquake, Stealth Rock, Ice Shard, and Rock Slide. Olin the Excadrill with Earthquake, Iron Head, Rock Slide, and Swords Dance. New Zealand with Earthquake, Crunch, Outrage, and Bulk Up. Portland with Earthquake, Liquidation, Dragon Dance, and Tickle. And finally, Holland with Crunch, Bulldoze, Rock Slide, and Dragon Claw. And with five survivors remaining, it's finally time to take on the final challenge versus Champion Leon. His first Pokemon is of course Aegislash, so I go ahead and lead with Mamoswine. The first turn he goes for King Shield, which ends up being absolutely perfect since I take that turn to use Stealth Rock. It's mostly going to come in handy versus Charizard, but a bit of chip damage versus everyone is going to be useful regardless. I then use an Earthquake, but since Aegislash is in Shield form, it ends up surviving in the yellow and goes for a Flash Cannon, taking me down to my focus. Sash. Leon then goes for a full restore, but since he's left his Aegislash in attack form and it only has base 50 defense, an Earthquake is definitely going to take it out. Next, he sends in his Haxorus, which is most likely going to go for Iron Tail, so I decide to swap out a Mamoswine into New Zealand to get that Intimidate. However, it ends up being a free switch because when it comes down to it, he just misses that Iron Tail anyway. Haxorus then goes for a Stab Outrage, which does a little bit above half after that Intimidate, and I go for an Outrage of my own, taking out the Haxorus in one shot. This brings in Leon's Inteleon, and unfortunately, since I'm locked into Outrage, he is going to be able to take me out with a Snipe Shot, but New Zealand has pulled its weight during this run. I send in Whizcash, and since Inteleon really doesn't have a great move to go for, I expect it'll probably go for a Tearful Look, so I go for a Dragon Dance, which will boost my attack back to neutral and my speed up one stage. The turn right after, the exact same thing happens where it goes for a Tearful Look, and I boost my speed up to plus two, which means that I'm now faster than Inteleon and can go for an Earthquake, but unfortunately, since I didn't get to keep those attack boosts, it only does about 60%, and he lowers my speed back down with a Mud Shot, which means he outspeeds with the Snipe Shot next turn. Whizcash being the absolute champ though, survives on 8 HP, taking out Inteleon with another Earthquake. This brings in Mr. Rhyme, and unfortunately we're in kind of an awkward position here where I don't really want to switch anyone in, so I just fire off as much damage as I can with an Earthquake as I unfortunately get taken down by a Freeze Dry. Much like Crocodile, Whizcash certainly served dutifully, and Mamoswine can follow up, going for an Earthquake which will take out the Mr. Rhyme. Leon now only has Dragapult and Charizard left, but unfortunately since I'm at only one HP with Judy Garland, I decide to go for an Ice Shard, and it's not quite enough, leaving Dragapult in the yellow as it takes me down with a Flamethrower. This means it's Garchomp's time to shine, and I know that Dragapult is going to outspeed, which is why I gave it an Assault Vest, however, it ends up getting the Paralysis with Dragon Breath. I fortunately still connect with the Crunch, meaning that Leon is now only left with Charizard. But since I got paralyzed, I now won't be able to outspeed, which means I have to survive an attack. Gigantamax Charizard goes for G-Max Overgrowth and hits me hard, but because of my Assault Vest, Holland ends up surviving, and it all comes down to connecting with this Rock Slide, but I end up fully paralyzed. This means that Charizard can take out the remaining health of Holland with a Max Airstream, boosting its speed, meaning that it's guaranteed to outspeed X 
Excadrill. Oh, not like this, not the entire run, just to get absolutely destroyed by a G-Max wildfire. If only this was part of some kind of backup plan. That's right, I was worried exactly this would happen, so I equipped Excadrill with a Focus Sash, meaning that we can take out Charizard with a Rock Slide. And what a way to beat a Pokemon Shield Hardcore Nuzlocke using only ground types. This run was honestly probably the most intense on the entire channel. I constantly had Pokemon going down because I didn't do any damage calcs whatsoever during the entire duration of the run. I just played the game the way anyone would normally through intuition, and it led to a lot of funny and stupid moments. Let me know if you think that's something fun that I should continue doing going forward, or if I should try to play optimally with calcs. Anyway, I'll see you next time for the randomizer. Well, goodbye, guys!